A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. As the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking to me say, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. Hard of face and obstinate of heart. And are they to whom I am sending you? But you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, 
insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given to him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter? the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Since the season of Easter ended and we came back into ordinary time, with the exception of that one Sunday where we had the solemnity of the birth of John the Baptist, all of our second readings have come from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Now, if you ever sit down and sort of read Paul's collection of, reading, uh, of letters, all the things that he wrote, you can come away with some of the characteristics of Paul. Like there was part of him that, quite honestly, he was sort of a know-it-all at points. He could be kind of a cranky nag. Uh, while he had a lot of good theological thought, there are times when he even wrote in a way that like, was almost manipulative, like, if you owe me anything at all, then please do what I want you to do, kind of sorts of things he would write. So he had his little quirks going on. But the community of the Corinthians that he writes to, he knew them well. And he loved them very much in spite of their quirks and their problems and their issues. But one of the reasons Paul writes to the Corinthians is this is that these other apostles have come along and they're trying to discredit Paul and who he is and what he's done. They're trying to show that they themselves have better credentials, that the Corinthians should therefore listen to them and not to Paul. Paul sarcastically, I believe, refers to these guys as super apostles as they boast about themselves. And as they try to discredit Paul, it elicits a very strong and passionate response from Paul, as you might imagine. He basically says, look, any title or distinction these super apostles have, I deserve it too. 
Just like them, I have worked wonders and miracles, and I have suffered for the gospel and the proclamation of the gospel. As a matter of fact, in chapter 11, right before today's second reading, he says this, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. The only thing missing there is, so there. <laughs> as he tries to prove just how much he has done for the sake of the gospel. As we hear in today's reading, he even says he's had visions and revelations from God, probably what we would call mystical experiences. His point being that if anyone deserves respect as an apostle, it's him for all he's done. But after he gets through that, there's this change in tone we hear today as he shares something actually very personal, I think, and very intimate and something that was a difficulty for him. Because in the end for Paul, it's not how much he as a man has accomplished for God, but what God has accomplished through him. And so he shares that despite all his success of his apostolate, he has a problem, that he's broken, that he has a weakness, what he calls a thorn in the flesh. Now, there are a lot of theories as to what Paul is referring to today as he says he has a thorn in the flesh. But we really don't know what his weakness was. He never says specifically whether it was physical or psychological or relationship with a person. We just don't know. But we know it was a struggle for him. So much so that he tells us he went to God and prayed that God would take it away from him. He says, three times I begged the Lord that this might leave me. But he said to me, effectively, no you get to keep your weakness. You get to keep your thorn in the flesh because my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul begins to realize, he has the wisdom to know that God will not take this weakness, this thorn in the flesh away from him because it reminds him that he's dependent on God. It reminds him that the success he's having is not because of his effort, but because of God working through him. And so in the end, he actually says of his weakness, of his thorn in the flesh, I will rather boast most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So therefore I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with hardships, with persecutions and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He realizes that his brokenness, his weakness, as long as it doesn't take him into sin, reminds him of his need for God, for him to know any success in his life at all. It's pretty beautiful, actually. Can you imagine being proud of and boasting of your weakness? Boasting of your thorn in the flesh because you see through it how God works in the world? I mean, what does this say for us? Well, I think first we need to recognize that we all have a thorn in the flesh. We're all broken. We all have a weakness. I mean, if you think you're a perfect 10, try talking to the people you live with <laughs> and ask them. They'll help you see the truth that we all have something in us that is a struggle for us. Some of us are too proud. Some are too arrogant. Some um, don't have a backbone. Some uh, struggle with uh, depression. 
some with addiction, some people's struggle is physical, some people's struggle is mental, some people's struggle is moral, some struggle in the relationship with Christ, with their family, with those they work with, with their friends. We all have brokenness. We all have weakness. And we can benefit from Paul's deep insight that that weakness, which we tend to try to not like and try to stay away from, can actually give us great insight to our need for God in our life. Now, last April, on the second Sunday of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday, when I was in Rome, it just happened to be that on that Sunday, they were running the Roman Marathon. And um, so the marathon went all throughout the city to visit all of the big sites in the city you would want to see. And it was kind of funny because on that Divine Mercy Sunday, we were on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica with the Holy Father celebrating Mass. So St. Peter's Square was full of people and were celebrating Mass. And in the back of the square, the marathon was going past. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, I've never seen so many people arrive late for church and leave early from church. <laughs> there they went. But the marathon was going on all day, and towards the evening, it was basically over. Everybody had run. And um, I was in Piazza Navona with some friends just having some refreshments. And they hadn't picked up the barricades and everything from the marathon yet. And there was a reason why. Because as we sat there, there was suddenly this like activity at the far end of the piazza and some applause happening. And then they came into sight. The last, I don't know, 12 or 15 people running the marathon. And they were people with physical disabilities. People who, for the most part, were in sort of those special wheelchairs or, or carts with a loved one, a father or a mother or a daughter or a son or a friend, pushing them, running them through, right? And as they came through, everybody in the piazza, whatever they were doing, eating or taking photos or doing art or just playing whatever, just stopped what they were doing and stood up and applauded for those 12 or 15 people coming through. And when I looked at the reading today, I thought, what a wonderful visual, what a marvelous image for us today, that here were these people with a thorn in the flesh, with a brokenness, with a weakness. And through that, the strength of another was revealed, and it took them to some place they never would have gone before and enabling them to accomplish something they would have never been able to do on their own. Because a loving father, let's just say, had them from behind. Someone had their cart and kept them going in spite of their weakness. God's got our cart in spite of our weakness. And if we allow him his strength in our weakness will take us places we could never get and enable us to do things we would never accomplish. I really think from Paul's letter today, there's maybe three things that we could take home and perhaps reflect on them in your 10-minute-a-day prayer time this coming week. The first is this, that God does not need you to be perfect for him to work out his providential and divine plan in your life. He does not need you to be perfect. And that can be hard to hear because we spend so much of our time trying to look perfect to the world. But he doesn't need that at all. God does not disassociate himself from those who struggle, for those who have problems. If he did that, he'd have to disassociate himself from the entire world. But not at all. And I know too many people who back off of whether it's ministry in the church or the way they might live in their family or with their spouse or with their workmates or with their friends or whatever, who, who back off from making space for certain godliness in their life because they think, I don't have the knowledge or I don't have the skills or I don't have the aptitude or I don't have the giftedness. And so they deny themselves a certain depth of life that could be there if they allowed their weakness to be a place where God just might be working, where God just might be moving. Our weakness gives God a great scope in which to accomplish his plan. You don't have to be perfect, which is great news because none of us are. Second thing, flip side. There are some people 
who are deeply aware and profoundly knowledgeable about their giftedness, about their goodness, about their talents, about their skills, so much so that they leave little room for God. They sort of get out and try to push their own cart, if you will, which usually is going to end up in disaster and not get you to some place you wouldn't otherwise go. They get out and try to push their own cart. Having an awareness of our vulnerability and of our need and of our weakness where God can move is so essential in the Christian life. Not that it should lead us into sin, but make us aware of, I really do need God in my life. I think so many people are out pushing their own cart, using everything they got, making it happen, trying to make it work. And it's the reason why you end up with so many people who have lackluster in their life and who end up feeling disappointed despite endless hours and constant success. It just doesn't fulfill them because they've cut God out of the picture by trying to ignore the fact that they're broken too. They have a thorn in the flesh. So God doesn't need us to be perfect, but we do need to be aware that we're broken. And the third thing, that consciously or unconsciously, we have to be very careful about expecting perfection in one another. None of us are perfect. We are all open to criticism. Parents, children, priests, bishops, pope, even, believe it or not, our elected representatives in Washington, D.C. <laughs> no one is perfect. I honestly believe that the vast majority of people try their best, but let's face it, none of us have all the skills and gifts and talents necessary to take on every challenge and everything in life with profound success. None of us can do that. But it doesn't mean we're worthless either. That when we let our weakness remind us of our need for God, amazing things can happen. That God has our cart. There's no doubt that Paul was an incredibly intelligent man and very, very persuasive in his speech, but also a man of great wisdom who realized the truth of our human condition that we all are broken and that God works through it, that it's there that strength is revealed. It could be kind of a profound experience for us if we take the time to look at our weakness, which probably most of us know really well, and see how, when it's not leading us into sin, it can lead us to a deep dependence upon God. Let that visual be with you of those fathers and mothers and sons and daughters pushing their loved ones onto great success. That is what God does for us in our weakness. He has our cart.